All right, I'm here with Skeleton Lipstick, who's a first wave vaporwave artist, as well as part of the uh, Hot Takes podcast, the founder of Terminally Chill Vaporwave uh, live events, and um, just released his, or re-released, uh, Glows Then Melts, his first LP on Needle Juice Records, the brand new pressing, some sweet splatter vinyl, as you can see there. So... You're pretty experienced with live performance, and you even run Terminally Chill. So for those of us who haven't been, what's that like? And do you perform at those? No, I always perform at that. I always do DJ sets at that, for sure. I actually make sure that Terminally Chill, that I go on. So I run the party, so I make sure that I go on and do a set almost after every, you know, so we'll have a, m multiple DJs or multiple artists come in to do DJ sets and I'll let them do, the, I'll let them do the DJ set. And I usually come in and do a short set. And then the next person comes in and then I come in and do a short set because I can recalibrate the crowd. I've been DJing for a while. I know what'll work and that leaves a little bit more room for the other people to experiment. And then I can get on there and just, you know, reset the vibe again, reset the crowd again, do a set. And then the next artist can come on. I just I do it every time, so I know I know it works with with live dance party crowds. So you know, I always perform, and I always come in to make sure that the vibe is continuous. And I'll always organize, you know, which artists will go on when based on what I know about what kind of set they're going to put together. Wow! So with the transition to these virtual performances, where you can't read the crowd because a lot of times it's pre-recorded or there's a stream delay. How how do you still make sure your sets keep rocking? Because it's a it's a completely different format now. So when you're using, you cannot use the same sort of toolbox that you'd use for a live performance as you would for an online performance. In my opinion, you have to gauge things differently. So when I do the sets, usually every set I do is something kind of different. And with the sets that we do on the IRL performances, we have the benefit of planning it ahead of time, and we have the benefit of making it more individualized to us or the artist that is to say, and then we can also work with visuals, right? So you can do, I don't, I consider it to be a little audio visual presentation when we do these IRL events. So each one is different. My visuals are different for each one. The theme of each one is different. The one we do tonight is themed after basically, um, as if you've, um, act, you're, you're, you're channel surfing through a cursed cable network. And so that's the theme of the set for, for tonight's show. And, um, so that was one that, you know, that's something I couldn't do live, uh, you know, you, but with the IRL shows, you can create a narrative for what you do. I believe it's, I treat it completely different than when I do a live show. It's a hundred percent a different medium. One, you know, one is, um, one is one thing, one is the other. That's really interesting. And how are you achieving that cursed cable network, um, like narrative? Are you using all your own music or are you throwing in some other stuff? Um, so this set will be all my, this set is all my own music, um, particularly in, uh, recognition of the fact that Glows the Melts has been really released on vinyl. All the songs from this set are from that album and it's achieved through basically you are a viewer and you're scrolling through the channels and there'll be my songs with visuals associated with them. They'll be themed in a way as if it's a television program or an advertisement. And then in between each one, you'll be surfing through to, uh, different, um, warped visuals in between. Nice. It's very intriguing. Can't wait to see it. Um, <laughs> Thank you. you work a lot with synthesizers in your music. Um, so I'm kind of curious, what is your what is your synth setup like? Do you have a lot of hardware synthesizers? Do you go with kind of the more software ones? Uh, no, I, I actually um, I mostly only use hardware for for my music. Uh, it's either uh, I really am a big fan of this. I have a D50 over here, which is a so wonderful wonderful rollins synth from uh, the uh, mid 80s that is uh marked the transition from analog to digital and so there's all kinds of weird controls on it that aren't available on newer synths um we can get my dw800 over here uh, sh101 uh and sonic sq uh so basically yeah mostly i just use um hardware synths i do use digital synths i do use serum as well but i only use serum if i'm trying to produce a noise that is not uh, something you would you can create in reality so when i try to use serum i i try and limit it to basically you know what can be created that is very very obviously like a virtual sounding synth actually um i want to go back now to glows then melts um that d50 is that featured on that album 
Oh yeah, all over it. Mm -hmm. For sure. Where do you get a lot of your? This was all the way, uh, like you said, first wave, uh, vapor wave. And I just wanted was curious what your inspirations were around the time that you were you were making this this album. Yeah, absolutely. So I think with like a lot of other people from around that time, um, basically the influences can be traced to, uh, for me, One O Tricks Point Never, basically all his work. I think everybody around that time is inspired by a different piece by him. I personally was very inspired by the Ford and Low Patton work, and then also by the Games EP he put out. So that was a big influence on me, and that was combined with both, um, you know, seeing those chill wave artists right before us, like Neon Indian and Washed Out, sort of produce a different kind of sound that meshed electronics with textures. And before that, mostly I was used to textures and things like My Bloody Valentine or Shoegaze. So it was interesting to see a, uh, you know, a gauzy texture on that kind of independent kind of popish electronic music so that was a big thing for me seeing a marriage between like a, a shoegaze sort of sound and an electronic pop sound i like that a lot and then also combine that with just surfing on youtube and looking up uh videos from the 80s of music uh you know of obscure italo disco music or obscure new wave artists and then watching the old music videos which were recorded on vhs cassettes and appreciating not only the music that was being produced from those from those bands in the 80s but also the way of listening to it as decayed you know what i mean like that adds a whole other texture to it when it's decayed it's like recorded off a of vhs tape and translated on and that's the version of the song you're listening to because it's a reminder of the impermanence of things it's a reminder of the decay of things it's a reminder of the rot that inserts itself into all art and um it's fun to play with that rot and to yeah. put it into textures. And I like when things have a little rot on them because then you don't even know where it comes from. Then you're not even sure if it's from the past or if it's from the present or if it maybe is something not even made yet and people just playing with this texture. I, I really, for me, Vaporwave is not even particularly about nostalgia, but it's about confusion. And it's about the idea of not knowing when something happened or not knowing if you even just imagined it or not. You know, that's more vaporwave to me than the fixation on nostalgia, but more like the using of nostalgia as a way to confuse reality. You uh, also sing on this album, and yes. that was really early for vaporwave, and I don't think it was common to use original vocals on, on those tracks. So um, what was the, the reasoning behind that? Was it a habit from music making? You just like to sing, or were you going for something no, pushing the boundaries? I don't... I don't like to sing. I would have preferred not to sing personally, but you know, this is DIY. You got to do it yourself. Um, but I did want to sing. I did want, you know, I was once again inspired by watching those VHS tapes of with, uh, you know, the VHS uploads with pop vocals in them and, you know, the chill wave artists with vocals in them. And there were, uh, honestly, in the beginning, I would say there were quite a few people using vocals in that for first wave, including myself and George Clinton, who's Mirror Kisses at the time, or Surfing, or Bewilder Beast, or uh, Wasted Nights. You know, these guys were doing vocals, too. Um, I, I just, um, it just to me, it, 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 and I don't have vocals in all the songs, and but it, to me, it just seemed like another instrument to process and use as part of the textures. It's not like I, I didn't want to sing through these um, songs and then have my voice not have kind of distortion or changes made to it or warps, warping the uh, texture of it in some way. So, you know, it wasn't a straightforward singing. It was still, in my opinion, a way of uh, just adding another texture of confusion. I think we've talked probably at length about, about this album now. So I want to go look at some of your other, your other work. Um, one of your more interesting projects was uh, when you work with Luxury Elite or Lipstick Elite. So yes. I'm curious how that collaboration came about. Uh, I've been friends with Luxury since um, <clears throat> for a long time, since the beginning of this whole thing, since before she even was Luxury Elite and was um, kind of uh, just our friend. And then she eventually started Luxury Elite and became what she, you know, the amazing, amazing paragon that she is today. Fabulous. Absolutely love her. Uh, I came up, we came up with the idea basically um, in the idea. So basically the concept was, uh, and I've been friends with, with, uh, with her for a long time. And so the the plan was, Luxury would take the pop song and and then deconstruct the pop song to the point that it was an echo jam. So basically breaking down a pop song until it until its most basic unit, which is what a lot of echo jams are. And then I will take the unit and then from just using the unit, build it back up into a pop song and add vocals to it. And maybe some little synth flourishes and some drum flourishes, but make sure it's not obvious so you can't tell what is sample and what is synthesizer. 
So that's supposed to be, that was the most post vaporwave concept that we could come up with was the idea of taking the, you know, vaporwave is breaking, a, you know, echo jam of the echo jam of vaporwave is breaking down the pop song into the echo jam, the very small component, um, and then taking the small component and building it back up into a pop song. So, I mean, that was the most po post vaporwave concept that, uh, that made sense to me and her. Mm hmm. So that's what the point was, to make pop songs out of vaporwave songs, as opposed to vaporwave songs, which are made from pop songs. Well, that's all the time we have, but it's been great talking with you, and I'm excited here. Let's get into the set. 